So um, it's wonderful to be on this panel and with my um, colleagues and, uh, and uh, friends, uh, and uh, especially with um, uh, Kay Fangaraj, who I've worked with now for uh, almost 15 years very closely. Um, I'm going to be talking to complement the previous talks um, about uh, what uh, using uh, genomic studies to understand origins of human and culture in um, the place that has been studied the best in the world, not because it's more important than other parts of the world, but just because that's where the most funding and the largest number of samples is. Um, and it really shows um, some of the types of insights we can glean from this type of analysis. So um, I'm going to begin by showing a uh, picture uh, that is the type of picture that has often been shown in studies of human population history. Uh, here's from a paper in 2012, which shows a picture of dispersals uh, out of Africa uh, after about 50,000 years ago of a uh, more complex and more deeply divergent population that uh, formed within Africa earlier to that time and spread to different parts of the world. And there's a lot that's right about this picture in terms of the spread of people whose ancestry is closely related to uh, Africans and the great majority of ancestry of non-Africans does descend from this dispersal after about 50,000 years ago. But there's also a lot that's wrong about this picture. And we've learned a lot about what's wrong about that picture in the last uh, really uh, five or 10 years um, through application of um, ancient DNA and modern genomic techniques to show that this picture of initial arrival of people in different parts of the world and the people who live there today are descended in a simple way from the people who lived there before, there's problems with that picture. So, oh, let's see. Um, so in 1960, Luca Cavalli Sforza, who's uh, uh, now 60 years ago, really started this uh, field of using whole genome data to look at the past, made a bet that it would be possible to reconstruct the migrations of people around the world from variation in ancestry of people who live today, who's most closely related to each other. Um, and the idea was that at some level, people would remain in the same place. And therefore, by seeing how closely related people are today, you might be able to make inferences about how people got to where they are today. Um, and based on this, uh, he looked at a set with his colleagues at a set of about 100 variations in protein polymorphism. So these are like the ABO blood groups we often get measured for um, that vary in frequency across groups. And he saw which groups are most similar to each other with regard to their frequencies. And based on this, you can make uh, maps of gradients of similarity and frequency. And this is um, a redrawing of a map that was first made by him and his colleagues in the 1970s, showing a primary gradient of variation in one part of the world in Europe moving from Southeastern Europe to Northwestern uh, Europe. Uh, and he and his colleagues interpreted this as different proportions of ancestry from something we know from the archeological record, the spread of farming into Europe after 8,500 years ago from the Near East. And that this is sort of tracking the proportion of mixture. But now with ancient DNA from first farmers, we know that the proportion of farmer ancestry is actually almost the opposite of what's shown here, and it's going perpendicular to that, more from south or even southwest to northeast rather than the reverse. And the reason is, is that that spread of farming wasn't the only population change that transformed Europe, other things did as well. So I'm going to be talking about this new scientific instrument that's come online in the last 12 years with the first whole genome data reported in 2010. Um, it starts with a human remain, like a bone or a tooth, and in a clean room where the goal is to get beneath the surface of the remain to the parts that are not contaminated by archeologists or people in the lab handling the material, we try to take out a particularly DNA rich part of this uh, bone or tooth. Uh, we extract a very similar to the protein. We sequence in one of these sequencers that has dropped the cost of sequencing in two decades by a factor of about 1 million and has made it possible to carry out these studies. As a result of these innovations, there's been an explosion in the amount of data on a genome scale uh, from ancient people. 
Um, and it's now possible to regularly get DNA from people who lived 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, even sometimes more than 100,000 years ago, that from many perspectives is similar in quality to what you get from modern medical genetic sequencing. It's kind of a miracle that DNA is preserved like this, and it's opened up so many windows into the past. So from 2014, where we had about 50 individuals with whole genome data, we now have about 100 times that or more, and it's continuing to grow very rapidly. So what have we learned from this innovation? So what ancient DNA does is it allows you to get back beyond being trapped in the present and being uh, only faced with the incredible diversity we have today. Incredible as it is, it doesn't capture the time dimension, and we're trapped in the present. So if you can look in the past and see how people from past archaeological cultures relate to other archaeological cultures, people who lived in those cultures, and to people living today, you can ask questions about how change occurs over time. So that's a very powerful thing to be able to do. So I'm going to start by zooming into Western Eurasia. As I said, not because this is a more important part of the world, but it's because we have so much data. And I'm going to start with the question about what a, quote, white person means. Um, there's this idea that I think is very much around and that I basically learned when I was a kid um, from the school even, which is that um, people who are, quote, white today refer to a genetically or phenotypically broadly similar group of people living all the way from Central Asia and Iran to the Atlantic shores of Europe um, and have spread beyond through the history of colonialism in the last centuries um, and might reflect a migration to Europe and um, after about 50,000 years ago from a group that came earlier into Africa. But that's not true. So if you look at data from 2016, here's a paper we published that reported data from more than 8,000 years ago from the first farmers from uh, the Near East and from Iran and compared it to uh, Eastern European and Western European hunter-gatherers that we and others had published. And what we found is that these four populations were each as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians. Even though today, this region, everybody's genetically pretty similar from the perspective of the frequencies of genetically variable positions. At that time, it contained four groups as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians. So if one was able to go back in a time machine and categorize people by their groupings, it would look nothing like today. So these bars show proportions of ancestry from these th four sources. And the question immediately arises, which one of these is the primary ancestry of people living today? Um, and how did the situation of relative homogeneity emerge from the situation of extreme heterogeneity? And the answer is that none of these groups disappeared. They just mixed with each other to produce the very low level of differentiation that we observe today. And so this phenomenon of, quote, white people, a relatively low degree of um, genetic differentiation is just a product of profound mixture that happened uh, in the Copper Age and Bronze Age um, of groups that were much more differentiated before. Now, this is not unusual in the world. We are increasingly seeing this as we get DNA data and ancient DNA data from many, many parts of the world, in Africa, in South Asia, in parts of the Americas, and in many other places. So now I'm going to zoom more tightly, not just into Western Eurasia, but into Europe. And in 2014, we knew that before 5,000 years ago, Europeans were a mixture of two ancestries shown in these bar plots for real individuals we had data from. Green is hunter-gatherers, and blue are these farmers from the Near East, from Anatolia, Turkey. But today, there is this big red ancestry that didn't exist 5,000 years ago. So something happened after 5,000 years ago in Europe that's really profound. And so we and others set out to try to understand that, and here's what happened. So I'm not going to go into the details of exactly how this analysis is computed, because I don't have time. But what you see here are a thousand dots corresponding to present day people from the following locations in Europe and Western Eurasia. And they're colored by their locations. And this is the result of a principal component analysis. So the data is the following. Um, we are looking at about 600,000 positions in the genome where people vary from each other. They're known as single nucleotide polymorphisms where some people have one type and some people have another type. And since you have two chromosomes, one from your mother and one from your father, you can be two adenines, that's one of the DNA letters, an adenine and a cytosine, or two cytosines, so zero, one, or two. And so you have a 600,000 row table corresponding to all the positions analyzed and about a thousand column table corresponding to all these individuals. You multiply the table by itself to see how closely related every other samples to each other, you get a thousand by thousand square table. 
and you perform principal component analysis to most efficiently separate the individuals. That's this plot here, which is an X, Y scatter plot, but you're not, I'm not showing the axes. And this is where the individuals fall and you see an amazing pattern where uh, these people split into two parallel gradients, Europe and the Near East with relatively few people in between. The Northern groups are at the top, the Southern groups are at the bottom. I'm now gonna gray out the modern individuals and I'm gonna show you how the ancient individuals fall. So if you look at where hunter-gatherers from Europe fall, they fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. So what that's telling you, and we can show this and prove this, is that Europeans today are a mixture of these hunter-gatherers who no longer exist in unmixed form, but contribute in mixed form to Europeans and people from the Near East. Then after 8,500 years ago, when farming arrives in Europe, boom, there's this pile up of uh, Anatolian farmers at the bottom of the European gradient. Meanwhile, in the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Sea, this group forms, but you still don't see people like Europeans today. That only happens after 5,000 years ago, between five and 4,000 years ago, and that mixture between this group and this group, this group from the steppes and this group from Anatolia happens only after 5,000 years ago. So a summary is there's a first major migration of farmers from Anatolia, uh, into the Europe after 8,500 years ago. It's a profound event. It displaces about 80% of the local population um, and produces people with bar charts like this. And then there's another, and it wasn't known before ancient DNA, very large scale movement that in some places replaces 70% of the ancestry like Germany from people from the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Sea. So now I'm gonna go and zoom into Britain, an even smaller place uh, where we have uh, quite amazing data. And I'm going to show you what happened as this steppe ancestry from the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Sea hit Britain. So this is a time transect from 6,000 years ago to 3,000 years ago. And here's the proportion of people who have ancestry from the steppe. And there's no people like that from 6,000 years ago when farming arrives to 4,500 years ago. The last big stones at Stonehenge, the big monument that some of you may have visited, go up and is built by descendants of these first farmers. And then after about 4,500 years ago, before 4,400 years ago, bang, there's a huge migration into Britain from the continent. And it's a 90% minimum population displacement from the continent. It's a very dramatic event. Um, and ever afterward, there's large proportions of ancestry from north of the Black Sea in Britain. And the people of Stonehenge contribute very little to people in Britain today, whereas this is um, a primary ancestral population of people in Britain today. Now, just as a comparison, I'll show you what happened in Iberia. This is Spain and Portugal in the same time period. In the same time period from 6,000 to 4,500 years ago, there is no steppe ancestry. And at the same time, bang, it arrives. And there's actually a period of coexistence of these two populations where we observe individuals of both ancestral types. And then after about 4,000 years ago, these two groups collapse into each other with what's more like a 40% displacement of the local population not as dramatic as in Britain, but actually something quite dramatic happens. If you look at the coloring of the dots, that corresponds to the Y chromosomes of the individuals. The open circles are females and the colored circles are males. So we can determine whether their Y chromosome is typical of the steppe north of the Black Seas or not. And what you see is red is this steppe type Y chromosome. You see that after about 4,000 years ago, it's the only type of Y chromosome that's left in Iberia. So even though it's only 40% genome-wide replacement, it's about 100% Y chromosome replacement. And that's telling you that these incoming groups, the males from this group outcompeted the local males. And so it was a pro probably a quite unequal interaction between the incomers and the locals where the com males coming in displaced the local males. So it tells you something about that event. Okay, now I'm gonna go even more detail into Britain. What, what happened in Britain? So the ice age peaked between 25 to 17,000 years ago. The north of Europe as the north of North America was covered by a big ice sheet and the areas to just to the south of the ice sheet were also uninhabitable. Nobody lived in Britain at this time. There had been humans like Neanderthals, for example, in Britain before this time, but they were completely cleared out by this climatic event. Um, and then people start coming back into England uh, at the end of the glacial maximum, first episodically and then to stay. And the oldest complete or nearly complete skeleton is someone individual found in Cheddar Gorge, where Cheddar Cheese is from, about 10,000 years ago. And 
uh, genetically, you can actually predict what this person would have looked like based on the, their eye color and their skin color. And it's very clear that this individual would have had quite dark skin, almost as dark as many groups in Africa or as dark as many groups in Africa. And blue eyes, a combination rare today, but frequent in hunter-gatherer in Europe. So how much ancestry from such people is left in Britain? That's what I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to tell you uh, about what we know from the place in the world where we actually know the most about ancient DNA because we have the largest amount of data. And so I'm going to start on the right with the percentage of ancestry from these hunter-gatherers like Cheddar Man about 10,000 years ago. So 10,000 years ago, it was 100%. 6,000 years ago, there's a rival of farmers, and it's a 99% replacement of the local population. So only one out of every 100 ancestors after that point would have been from the population of Cheddar Man. Then the event I told you about before, a 90% population replacement uh, that results in now only one in a thousand ancestors coming from that hunter-gatherer population. And then uh, here's a new Samu work that we're uh, working on where we find a 50% pop population replacement in the late Bronze Age. Here's just to give you a flavor of it. Here's the proportion of farmer ancestry in Britain. And these are all individuals, these blue and red dots. And what you see is here between 1000 and 8000 BC, that's 3000 to 2800 before present, there is a pulse and an increase in ancestry. And we can show that corresponds to a 50% population replacement. Um, and then the Saxon is probably another 40% population replacement. So today, only one in 3000 British ancestors lived with Cheddar Man and only one in 30 or fewer in the population that built Stonehenge. We know this because we have so many British genomes, but it seems to be the rule in history that again and again, the people who live in a place today descend relatively little from the same people who lived in the same place long ago. Um, although there are probably places that are more exceptional to the rules than that rule than others. But more and more, the more data we get, the more this seems to be what we observe. So I'm gonna end with a riddle from ancient Athens and ancient classical world. Um, and it's also motivated by the question that I've been thinking about a lot, about what do DNA studies of history tell us about the relationship between genetics and identity and what you think of yourselves. And so the riddle is the following. So I'm going to uh, quote um, Plutarch, uh, who's a Roman historian and philosopher and essayist who wrote biographies of mythical and real characters. So he says, the ship where Theseus, this Greek hero in the U youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars and the Athenians preserved it um, because it was such an important ship. And they took away the old planks as they decayed over time and they put in new and stronger timber in their places insomuch that this ship became a standing example amongst the philosophers. People said, is it the same ship? One side holding that the ship remained the same and the other contending that it was not. This is sort of related in my mind to the genetics because over time, are British today the same as the British who built Stonehenge or the British who uh, are Cheddar Man? Um, Thomas Hobbes, a philosopher in Britain in 1655, uh, added another element to this ship of Theseus riddle. He said, if that ship of Theseus were, after all the planks changed, the same ship it was at the beginning, and if some person had kept the old planks and by putting them afterward together in the same order, order um, he kept them in like a shack or something and again made a ship of them, then this would have been the same ship, right? And so there would have been two ships the same. So the question is like, what is, what is identity? How much connection can people in Britain today claim to the builders of Stonehenge from whom they are hardly descended at all? And my view is that people in Britain can claim a lot of connection to the people of Stonehenge. It's the place where they live today. It's a place they can justifiably feel proud of. But I think we can all feel connected to Stonehenge because we're all connected to each other. And I think we all have a shared right to our common past.